so we've covered a lot of ground uh, regarding the biology of head and neck cancer and the um, prognostic implications of, of different uh, elements uh, in, in a patient. Let's now move to talk about the multidisciplinary treatment of patients with advanced, and, and we're talking primarily about local regionally advanced uh, head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. So let's first, Kevin, if you could tell us a little bit about the multimodality uh, therapy of these patients. Uh, is it important? Uh, do we routinely do it? And, and uh, your personal experience as well. So I think the key to the most effective multimodality therapy is to work within a well-convened multidisciplinary team because no individual who manages patients with head and neck cancer is capable of making decisions accurately about the surgical treatment, the radiotherapy and the cytotoxic chemotherapy and indeed now the biologic therapies on their own. And so it's important that we have a multimodality team involved in this. So having convened those, and now in the United Kingdom, and I suspect throughout most of the world, it is compulsory to manage patients within a multidisciplinary team setting. I think what we do is we discuss patients very, very um, in great detail, and we make appropriate decisions whereby we select either surgery, plus or minus post-operative radiotherapy, chemo radiation, or a non-surgical approach. Um, and as a result of those decisions, I think we're beginning to see significant improvements in outcomes for patients. Patients are being spared inappropriate treatments. So for instance, patients who should not be operated on are spared those operations because they may then just simply go on and have chemotherapy and radiation therapy, and vice versa. Patients who have surgically curable disease should be identified and offered that because the post-operative treatment may be gentler and have better functional outcomes for those patients than primary non-surgical treatment up front. So the practice in the United Kingdom, and I think throughout much of the world, has now completely been revolutionized by this approach, and patients are deriving significant benefit from these treatments. Now, in addition to that, of course, alongside that, there has been an incremental improvement in the techniques involved in providing surgical care, including such techniques, which I'm sure we'll discuss later, uh, transoral robotic surgery and um, laser resection of tumors. Radiotherapy technology has improved significantly with the view to reducing uh, morbidity. And in addition, the use of concomitant chemotherapy in the appropriate groups has become the standard of care. So I think we've seen real advantages for patients as a result of that. Hi highlighting really the importance of that multidisciplinary approach. Victor, tell me what goes on at your center. I think the selection of patient is really key and, and that's something that has evolved over, over the um, past years and um, so we spare toxicity whenever it's possible and, and certainly um, this is the, the, the distinction between surgery and, and uh, primary uh, radio chemotherapy is really key. And um, what, what we um, also implemented then is um, once you um, have your high-risk population identified, let's say they had surgery initially and had lymph nodal disease that spreads beyond the capsula, so that we intensify treatment for those patients. So we use radiochemotherapy. I think this is, um, there are good data to, to support that kind of notion. So, um, um, so we're more and more getting down to the subgroup of patients that need intensified treatment or those that um, do not, this multimodality approach with having or the different items in place uh, for delivering the therapy to these patients. And I think it, it, you know, it comes from a good reason because of those long-term results that we talk about and you know, the combination is more toxic, has long-term effects on outcome in these patients. So uh, I think it's very important to, um, to select the right patient um, uh, for appropriate treatment. Can I, yeah, can I chime in just very yeah. briefly? I couldn't agree more with my colleagues, uh, Kevin and, and Victor, about the importance. And the one point I would like to add is it's very clear that centers that do high volumes of head and neck cancer care, specialized centers, have better outcomes. So I think head and neck cancer patients should be treated, especially for the curative intent setting, in large centers with extensive experience. And Tongi, just to follow up on that, I, I have a feeling that um, those larger centers in their multidisciplinary uh, tumor board have uh, other uh, individuals in the room that help to inform treatment. So we, we talked about uh, medical oncologists, surgeons, we talked about radiation oncologists. But who else is at your tumor board uh, that's helping to manage the patient? Yeah, I think it's a great point. It takes literally a large team to do this because these patients get quite sick. I mean, we're treating them for cure, but it takes a lot of effort um, 
supporting patients through the very aggressive treatment at times, and you have you know, severe side effects, mucositis, weight loss, um, and uh, many other implications from radiation, chemotherapy, and surgery. So we have nutritional support, we have physical therapy, uh, we have speech and swallowing, the dentists are involved. Not all of them always show up to the tumor <laughs> board, but oftentimes they are representatives, and I think it really, the room is full. The room is packed when we have a, a tumor board every week, and it makes a difference. I think that's part of the, the good outcomes is that everybody works together. You don't want to start chemoradiation and then halfway through the patient is emaciated um, and cannot continue treatment. I think it takes that level of experience, being comfortable with toxicities to get the patient tr uh, through the treatment and ultimately achieve a cure. And I have to say there's, there's something about everybody being in the room at the same time reviewing the case, looking at the scans, looking at the pathology, and really having that, that exchange that I think is critical to those early management decisions um, that really can make the difference between a, a, a good outcome, the outcome you want, and, and, and one that you don't. Yeah. So there's couldn't also, agree with you more. Yeah. Yeah. And there's also a trend to go even further, um, where even at the initial visit, you have multidisciplinary clinics where all three specialties actually come together. Um, doesn't have to be this way, but it oftentimes is beneficial also for the patient that you have this initial discussion right away between different specialties who offer you know, different insight into the treatment. Yeah, and I think it's important to recognize the fact that, uh, you know, you might get the false impression that we present a case and everyone agrees with the management. <laughs> <laughs> That's definitely not the case. No, as everyone we, recognizes. we always agree, you know. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, it, I think it's really important, and, and I think it's important for the patients to know, and often, so the way we run our practice is that we will have the multidisciplinary tumor board, and then we will follow it with a multidisciplinary clinic. And quite often, we will present the patient with the fact that there has been some disagreement. The consensus recommendation has been for them to go forward for one form of treatment or another. And the patient then becomes part of that decision-making process as well. Of course, what often happens is that the patient will take the advice of, of the multidisciplinary team, but frequently the decision or the recommendation is out of kilter with what they themselves may want to do. And that, of course, then may change the management decision. It's a very good point, Kevin. Uh, and uh, and it's, it's, it's really interesting the way you, you approach it. Along with